A system of safe ports is vital to the prosperity and security of the United States. The United States Coast Guard is charged by law with maintaining the safety of these ports. As a captain of the port inspector, you represent the Coast Guard and play a major role in the port safety program. The importance of your appearance and attitude cannot be overemphasized. You will notice some variations in uniforms in this film. During its production, the captain of the port uniform was standardized and now consists of white coveralls, white safety helmet, and black safety shoes. A neat, proper uniform worn by a courteous, business-like inspector will earn the respect of his shipmates, his superiors, and most important of all, the crews and operators of vessels and facilities which he inspects. The Code of Federal Regulations, Title 33, Part 6, Chapter 126, requires the Coast Guard to maintain the security and safety of vessels, harbors, and waterfront facilities of the United States. Part 126, specifically items 126.15 and 126.16, sets forth conditions and requirements which must be met by waterfront facilities to pass Coast Guard inspection. Captain of the Port Inspectors must be familiar with Title 33, Code of Federal Regulations, commonly known as CFR 33, and should have a copy available at all times during an inspection. Inspectors should also be familiar with and have a copy of Title 46, Code of Federal Regulations, Parts 146 to 149. Success of the port safety program is largely dependent on how well Coast Guard Captain of the Port Inspectors do their job. To get an inspection off to a good start, a cordial relationship should be established with facility operators and form CG 4200, Waterfront Facility Inspection Report, should be introduced at this point. This form serves as a guide to good inspection procedures. The facility name, location, and name of the operator should have been filled in on the form before leaving the captain of the port office leaving only the date and time of the inspection to be entered. The rest of the form must be filled out item by item as the inspection progresses. There must be an entry for each item in the yes, no, or see columns on the left-hand side of the form. If an item is not applicable to the facility being inspected, the letters NA should be written across the yes, no columns. The C column is used when immediate action is taken during inspection to correct a discrepancy. On the right-hand side of the form are spaces for entering the nature of non-compliance of items from Code of Federal Regulations, Title 33, Parts 126.15 and 126.16. Entries for these items are necessary when non-compliance is indicated in the No column. The same applies for entries in the Nature of Violations column for items under other sections of 33 CFR 126 and for the Nature of Discrepancies column alongside the block for listing items under other statute or regulation. An example of these would be Part 126.29. Near the bottom of the form are spaces for listing Principal Dangerous Cargo. It should be identified by name and class. The tonnage on board should be listed. And the storage bin or area indicated. In the company of a facility supervisor, guard, or other person with authority to take corrective action, the inspection should be carried out item by item as required on the form though not necessarily in the order in which they are listed. By questions and observation, inspectors must determine whether or not the facility has adequate guards for the operations being carried out, and that incoming and outgoing traffic is being properly checked and controlled. The next item concerns smoking regulations. Are adequately marked smoking areas provided? Is there indication of smoking in unauthorized areas? 
If so, the item must be checked in the No column and noted in the Nature of Non-Compliance column. Check all hot work, welding or burning for permits where required and proper procedures. Take a look around the facility for improperly parked vehicles. If any are found, an entry is made in the Nature of Non-Compliance column. If they are immediately moved, a check is made in the C column. Also check all automotive equipment such as forklifts, cranes, and mules for unsafe conditions like excessive lint, oil, or grease. These are fire hazards. Does all equipment have the required fire extinguishers in good working order? Is all automotive equipment properly stored in designated areas? Are there any refueling or fuel storage violations? The next item is rubbish and debris. If allowed to accumulate, it can become a fire hazard. Another potential fire hazard is excessive amounts or improperly stowed dangerous supplies, such as wiping cloths and cleaning compounds. Check their storage spaces carefully. To satisfy inspection requirements, electric wiring and equipment must be in good condition and meet electrical code standards. Defective or loose wiring must be permanently disconnected. Heating equipment must be safe and with adequate clearances from flammable materials. Fire extinguishing appliances must be in adequate number and size. The new dry chemical types have dials to indicate their condition. Older models carry tags showing inspection dates and condition. Fire equipment is next. Hydrants, standpipes, alarm boxes, and hose stations must be properly marked for easy identification, and all equipment must be in good condition. Hoses should be checked carefully for brakes and dry rot. Check the facility for adequate illumination, especially over stairways or ladders, and look for kerosene or gasoline lanterns. They are illegal. Fire equipment is no good if it can't be reached when needed. If vehicles, cargo, or dunnage is blocking such equipment, it must be removed immediately. Here is an instance where the C column can be checked since the discrepancy is corrected immediately. Check fire aisles and passageways for required clearance. Two feet between cargo and walls or between cargo and sides of buildings, inside or out and combustible materials must not be piled higher than 12 feet with 36 inches minimum clearance under trusses and beams and not less than 12 inches under sprinkler heads. There must be at least four feet of clearance around alarm boxes, extinguishers, hose stations, and other equipment. A main aisle must run the full length of the pier. If fire trucks will be required to control a fire, this aisle must be at least 20 feet wide. If access for fire trucks is not required, the aisle may be reduced to at least 8 feet wide. Cross aisles not less than 5 feet wide must extend to the sides of the pier at intervals of not more than 75 feet. These aisles and clearances are vital to the safety of the facility and should be checked carefully. Since the last two items on this part of the form are not applicable, the letters N-A should be written across the yes, no columns. The next items to be checked are listed under other sections of 33 CFR 126. These are dangerous cargo items. Before leaving the office, the inspector should determine what permits, if any, have been issued for the facility to be inspected. Class A explosives require a permit for each time such cargo is handled. The permit specifies the amount of materials authorized and the dates when it can be on board. 
A general permit is considered to exist for designated waterfront facilities for handling other than Class A explosives, unless suspended for failure to comply with the requirements of 33 CFR 126. Certain dangerous cargoes in excess of specified amounts require prior notification of the captain of the port. Specific information as to the amounts of dangerous cargo requiring notification of the captain of the port can be found in 33 CFR 126.27. Information regarding classes of dangerous cargo is found in 46 CFR parts 146 to 149. The first item to be checked is Class A explosives in excess of permit. On this pier, we have none. Then the remaining items, making appropriate entries on the form as each is inspected. Is there any designated dangerous cargo remaining on the facility? Are there any excessive dangerous cargoes? Any prohibited explosives? Is there any improper stowage or handling? or improper labels. Finally, is there any dangerous cargo aboard while a facility's general permit is suspended? Since this pier's permit is effective, the answer is no. The next part of the form is concerned with other statute regulations violations. Entries here will reflect conditions or situations found during the inspection which are not covered by specific items on the form. An example of this might be violation of Title 18, customs violations, or others of 33 CFR Part 126, such as failure to have the captain of the port or his authorized representative supervise designated dangerous cargo handling operations. Space is provided on the form for citing the applicable law or regulation and the nature of the discrepancy. The bottom portion of this form, titled Principal Dangerous Cargo, Slant Class, is workspace for the inspector. It is generally used to diagram the location of various types of dangerous cargo present on the facility at the time of the inspection. Quantities of the various types can be listed in the tonnage columns. The bin or storage area should be indicated in the right-hand column. This information may be very valuable in case of fire or explosion on the facility. This completes all items of the inspection. One inspector must return to the office and advise the peer operator of any violations. The inspector and operator's representative must sign the report. Then a copy is given to the peer operator. Good inspection and enforcement procedures are necessary to a successful port safety program. And port safety is vital to our country.